Collins & Co's not-for-profit conference, Be Empowered Through Knowledge, is designed specifically for the not-for-profit sector. Our speakers are experts in this sector and their practical approach provides not-for-profit board members and management with the opportunity to improve their skills and knowledge across a range of specialist topics. The conference also provides a great networking opportunity. Partner Fabio Camerano introduces our next speaker. Penny Smiths, who is the founder and owner of Wordplay Public Relations. Wordplay Pu Public Relations is a boutique PR consultancy specialising in helping not-for-profit and small business clients achieve their communication goals. So without further ado, please welcome Penny. Okay, hi everybody. Thank you very much for sticking around after lunch. I realise that that's a pretty tough act to follow. Um, for those of you who I haven't met yet, and as Fabio mentioned, my name is Penny Smits, and I'm the founder and owner of Wordplay PR, um, where I work with everybody from small community organisations, startups, and sole traders, right through to large corporates and large non-profit charities, either providing communication support to their marketing teams or working directly with their chief executives as an outsourced communications manager or PR advisor. So during this time, I've helped clients create highly engaging and trending social media campaigns, but I've also helped organisations navigate some of the tricky issues and challenges that social media can present, which is what I'm here and to talk to you about today. So yeah, a bit more about me, um, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm, I'm originally from New Zealand, sorry. Um, I moved to Australia in 2010 and my background is as a journalist, so both print and radio. So as my opening slide demonstrated and um, as Bob Dylan opined, the times they are are changing and um, these statistics kind of demonstrate how. So as that first statistic demonstrates, Australian consumers have an insatiable appetite for mobile technology. According to Deloitte, almost 80% of Australians have a smartphone and there are around 15 million smartphones in use across Australia. It's important to note too that of those 100 billion global monthly Google searches, more than half of those are now coming from a mobile device. So in short, Australians love their smartphones. Some reports indicate that Aussies are glancing at their phone 440 million times a day. So if I note you looking at your smartphone during this presentation, I won't at all be offended. And this infographic kind of demonstrates the data that could be distracting them. So what this is, is an indication of the amount of data that's generated globally every minute. So if we look at some of those statistics, more than 4 million Facebook likes, 1.7 million Instagram likes, more than 300,000 tweets every minute. It's quite staggering, really. So what all this demonstrates is that the digital revolution has fundamentally changed all aspects of our lives, but most importantly, it's changed the way we communicate and how we gather information. We are now a generation of anywhere, anytime, any device users, which means we can receive information as it happens, which is a good thing. Communication between organisations and the audiences is also far more democratic than ever before, which is also a good thing. But what this also means is that gone are the days of tomorrow's fish and chip paper. Today, with news outlets publishing stories online and with the millions of social media conversations that are happening every minute, the fallout from a misguided tweet or a mismanaged crisis can be accessed forever via simple Google search and can severely damage an organisation's reputation long term. Your taxis. Fresh in our memories. Put out your dress. These are all social media campaigns from last year that received the unenviable title of PR fails. Now, some of what I might talk to you, be talking to you about today may seem common sense. But what these campaigns show us is that sometimes common sense isn't that common. 
Today I thought it would be good, rather to focus on the negative, to actually go through some best practice social media guidelines. They're not rules, there are no rules, it's mainly guidelines. And also provide some examples of how social media can be your best defence in managing a crisis and can actually even turn your harshest critics into raving fans and advocates. It sounds unbelievable, but it can happen. So of the perceived reputational risk that's associated with social media, it's no surprise, I guess, that so many members of the C-suite are reluctant to get on board. A survey of Fortune 500 CEOs found that more than half have no social media presence whatsoever, and only 60% of CEOs who have Twitter accounts are actually tweeting. Now, I'm cognizant of the fact that there are no Fortune 500 CEOs in this room, but I raise these findings because they're generally indicative of the conversations I have with senior le leaders of organisations. They're on the fence about social media because, A, they lack resources and the time to dedicate to managing mul multiple social media channels. They have questions regarding the return on investment that social media provides, but mainly they're fearful. They're fearful about liability, or making a wrong move. They're not digital natives and they lack training and they also fear that this knowledge gap will be perceived as a weakness. I raise this because if a senior team leader or chief executive has doubts about the value of social media, it's like unlikely that they'll take responsibility for driving innovation for their organisation and then the wider sector via digital channels. So if that resonates with you, then I'm here to wholeheartedly encourage you to be part of the online conversation because social media can and does provide so much value to non-profit organisations. Firstly, social media is a great way to connect with a wide range of stakeholders from beneficiaries to board members. And I know that at times board members can feel a bit removed or remote from an organisation and social media provides a great platform for engagement and two-way conversation. And it's important to note that social media is not just a thing for young people. In fact, globally, some of the biggest growth in social media use is among those aged 65 and older. The older demographic, we know, are perhaps more likely to donate, but they also are perhaps more likely to be beneficiaries of your charities, especially for those working in the health sector. There are lots of different types of organisations here today, and we know that a not-for-profit could include an advocacy group, a health promotion charity, an aged care organisation, or a sports club. So the, ch uh, the challenges that these charities face are diverse um, and demanding, and social media is well placed to face all of these demanding requirements and aims. And also, while some may have doubts regarding the ROI of, of social media, it is a cost-effective medium. However, of course, labour costs or voluntary hours and in-kind support do need to be factored into this equation. So every good scout knows that it pays to be prepared, and then in the case of online reputational management, this of course means having a functional social media plan. It also means being aware of organisational risk and having contingency planning in place for potential backlash or reputational fallout from social media campaigns, no matter how well-intentioned they are. So this involves reviewing or having another party review the campaign and considering all potential reactions before execution. Okay, so the first step in creating a plan is to get to know your audience and to use any insights or analytical data that you have available to you. So this could include Facebook insights, Twitter or LinkedIn analytics, or even rich Google analytics data if that's something you have access to. Knowing who your audiences are, including their age, sex and location, can help you in developing a voice for your online communications. It will also help to inform you regarding peak posting times for maximum engagement. It will also help you in deciding which content your audience responds to and therefore what type of content will be most effective in your crisis communications. My second point is to determine your voice. 
Again, there are lots of different types of organisations in the room, and your online voice will be most probably be different depending on whether you're talking to elderly members of a uh, bowls club or to at-risk youth. So determining your voice also means having an idea regarding how you respond to comments made on your social media accounts, both positive and negative. These could take the form of key, uh, key messages or pre-approved messaging. So it could be best practice to have three go-to statements prepared to reply to positive comments and three prepared to for, plan for negative responses. Elaborating on that, having guidelines available for people at all levels of your organisation is best practice and make them simple and easy to follow. Your guidelines could, for example, include a flow chart clearly explaining who in your organisation responds in different crisis scenarios. Sometimes board members can have conflicting views to senior executives regarding management of an organisation. So it's proper to have clear guidelines around how they express those honestly held opinions online. And more generally, for all levels of staff to be provided with guidelines regarding their own personal social media use. After all, more than a few PR fails have been generated by a misguided tweet by a disgruntled employee. Finally, be open, honest and transparent in your online communications. Be polite and respectful and respond to comments with authenticity and sincerity. While I have advised that pre-planned responses or key messages do have a place in crisis communications, allow staff to have their own unique voice in communicating these key messages and responses. Social media, after all, is social for a reason. So be real and be human in your online responses. So what happens when a crisis hits? Well, your first step should always be to acknowledge that something has happened and to the best of your ability, explain what has happened. Respond in a timely manner. And after all, the beauty of social media, um, which is also one of the key risks, is its immediacy, which means you can provide your audience with frequent real-time updates regarding how you are responding to the issue. The next step is to apologise and to state your intention to resolve the issue. Again, be honest, be authentic and sincere in your apology. No buts, no heritage story, just we are sorry and we are working to fix this. Thirdly, take it offline. By that I mean if you are dealing with a, neg a negative comment that's a legitimate complaint, rather than um, get involved in public fisticuffs, encourage a discussion via private message or um, even encourage the complainant to um, provide you with their email or phone number. Then state publicly via the channel where the complaint was made what action you've taken and the outcome. Finally, keep engaging. Provide those real-time updates regarding the steps you are taking to resolve the issue. Listen to what your audience is saying and take cues from your audience as to when it's time to move on. It's also uh, pertinent to suspend any scheduled marketing posts or campaigns until that crisis is contained. So now I thought I would move into um, some case studies. So we're in to March now already, but um, last month Tripod Farms in Bacchus Marsh was forced to recall 30 of its loof lease Loose, well, that's a tongue twister, loose leaf salad mixes from supermarkets after the health department traced a number of salmonella cases to its products. There's no denying that this was a full-blown crisis, and here are some of the headlines about the crisis that made it into traditional media. So if we have a look, um, I thought I was going to die, and then I had 10 days of hell. Fears over salmonella salads, salmonella outbreak and lettuce, feared to be tip of the iceberg. So what did... Um, Tripod Farms do in response? Well, firstly, they published updates regarding the outbreak um, on a designated page on their website, and they shared those updates to their Facebook page, which was a long-established page. Their team responded promptly to customer concerns via Facebook. Um, they answered questions and corrected any misinformation in people's comments. And they also emphasised with the audience, so they talked to them, not at them, they apologised, they expressed regret, and they were sincere. 
So um, as a result of this transparency and despite the blistering and rather damaging coverage of the crisis in traditional media, Tripod Farms was actually getting five-star reviews in the midst of the outbreak, outbreak on Facebook, with existing customers writing supportive comments and advocating for the brand in response to some of the other ne more negative comments on the page. So my second case study relates to Dan from Optus, who was perhaps everyone's favourite social media superstar late last year. So what happened, op happened uh, Optus rolled out Arabic signage, signage in certain areas, letting people know about the different languages spoken by their staff. And unfortunately, Optus was inundated with complaints about the signs, they, and they actually had to be pulled from some areas after threats were made directly to staff. The outrage actually spilled onto Facebook, where Dan responded with respect and politeness, but also clearly communicated Optus's reasoning behind the advertisements. So Dan made national positive headlines for Optus as a result of his response. So a potential crisis was actually turned into a good news story. Previous aggrieved or on-the-fence customers reconfirmed their support of the brand because of Dan's response. Some people were even calling for him to be Prime Minister. So what did Optus do right? Well, clearly the organisation was aware of the potential fallout or backlash to this campaign, and they had key messages regarding the reasons behind the advertisement prepared. But they also allowed their public-facing staff, such as their social media managers, such as Dan and their customer service staff, to add their own personality and authentic voice in community, communicating these messages, which is ultimately what won Dan and Optus fans in the situation. So basically, some key takeaways to leave you with. So firstly, have clear guidelines for how your organisation communicates online and include your expectations for board members, key staff and, if appropriate, volunteers regarding their personal social media accounts. Empower your team to act swiftly when a crisis hits. Allow them to have their own voice in communicating key messages during a crisis. And finally, be authentic, empathetic, and demonstrate credibility and professionalism in your online conversations. Now, I'm aware that I've come in a bit short here, so if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I'm also out on an exhibition table, so we can have a chat later if you'd like. Hello. Oh, no. <laughs> Um, I just had a question about, um, you're talking about PR from an um, internal management strategy, but um, if you happen to have a legal practice with clients who, <laughs> who may not financially be in a position to take legal action and wanted to take avenues through publicity in terms of um, potentially... Um, so say, for example, if, you were, if it was a large organisation behaving badly, um, have you worked with those sort of clients or what's your sort of view on, I guess, using PR um, as another strategy to kind of, um, sounds terrible now that I'm asking the question out loud, but basically, yeah, have you worked with clients to give bad publicity to a third party? No. <laughs> okay. No, I haven't. I don't have experience with that kind of thing. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Short answer. <laughs> Um, how to go about that in terms of preparing a social media policy that, that treats that sensitively with people's personal accounts as well as their professional communications. Yeah. So I've seen that happen in another organisation very badly uh, where it was a very heavy-handed, very draconian social media policy which basically said you can't communicate on your personal email accounts about work and if you do say anything negative about you know, any personal opinion will reflect on your job. I mean, it was just outrageous. Yeah, I think it's great to have the, a social media policy as part of your onboarding process um, and have that quite clearly clearly explained to new staff members as part of their, their contractual arrangements. Do you have any examples of uh, what you would consider best practice or good policy available? Because I've, I just don't know where to position myself on it. Okay. So... Generally, obviously, 
um, a purpose, a people are allowed to have their honestly held and expressed opinions. Um, but it is, it is good to have some kind of oversight in terms of um, having designated people who are official spokespeople for, for the brand and um, empowering those staff members to have, um, have some understanding as to when, when they are talking and holding their own opinion and when they are commentating on the brand. So generally that, that kind of oversight as to what's expressed on behalf of the brand or on, on behalf of the organisation would perhaps come from internal and in-house and they would be charged with monitoring that. But it's, um, yeah, definitely having clear guidelines that are set by, by the organisation um, for new staff and also volunteers is key there. Penny. Thanks very much for your presentation. Um, we're here at the MCG and that uh, brings to mind a particular foundation. Uh, I won't mention its name, but uh, more generally, um, do you have any comments on uh, charities when they get into these crises about fundraising, when there are allegations of misappropriation or misallocation or just um, wanton expenditure on fundraising um, uh, events as distinct from applying their funds to their their beneficiaries? Um, I guess it depends on, in terms of, of on a case-by-case -case basis, whether something is, is before the courts or whether they're, they're at, how, how um, elevated that crisis is. Um, but certainly, even when things are before the courts, it is um, appropriate to disclose that um, or perhaps disclose the information you can or cannot share because that because of um, the information is before the courts. But also you can, of course, express um, remorse for the situation um, as a human organisation to the people who have experienced the fallout. Still, there is still capacity to do that. So remorse um, to people who have perhaps donated is distinct from the beneficiaries yep. acknowledging the role of donors in the process. Yes, yep. yeah. Thanks, Penny. Um, thanks for the opportunity for the question, Penny. I work in public housing. Uh, I try and rep re represent public housing tenants across the state. Um, quite often you see media stories and articles, you know, marginalising, stereotyping people who live in public housing. And I always wonder, should we respond to this crap? Or should, you know, how, sometimes it's better not to give oxygen to some of those things. What would your advice be, you know, particularly when there was some journalist when it's a slow news day, we'll get into public housing, you know? Great. Well, that's a good question because this is one of the advantages of social media because unlike traditional media where you're handing res um, responsibility or you're handing control over to a journalist, with social media, you as an organisation have, con have some level of control as to what you disseminate. So if I was um, perhaps working with you on a campaign, I would look at um, setting up a blog if one didn't already exist um, and, and obviously creating case studies or, or positive, um, positive representations of your organisation and, and, the, and the work that you do, um, as well as um, Facebook, Twitter, all, all of these elements can add to you basically controlling that narrative and help you in um, setting your own, your own story in your own storytelling. In terms of, in terms of response, responding to, to the media, I think that really, it really depends on organisationally what your, what your overall and overarching goals are. Um, if, if it directly involves your organisation and um, it, there is a mis mistruth or misinformation that has been published, then you absolutely have right of reply um, to go back to that journalist and to challenge that editor or that reporter on what's been reported. However, that's a little trickier if it's just a general, general story about the issues, which is then why, why social media then becomes a great ally for your organisation, because as I say, you can have some control over that narrative into what's being distributed. Thanks very much, Penny. Um, um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.